Welcome to episode 30 of Down on the Corner, the flagship show of KindnessCorner.com. I'm your host, Mark Roseman, and tonight promises to be another amazing night as we welcome one of the most dependable right-handed relief pitchers in Major League Baseball from 1985 to 1996. He played for our beloved New York Mets, the Philadelphia Phillies, the Dodgers, uh, Texas Rangers, and Baltimore Orioles, leaving an indelible mark on both the National and American Leagues. His contributions were a key in securing the 1986 World Series Championship for the New York Mets, where he notably clinched victory in the decisive Game 7. Additionally, he served as a pitching coach for the Atlanta Braves, taking over for the legendary Leo Mazzoni from 2006 to 2017. His legacy extends past statistics. Uh, he's also known for his practical jokes and, of course, the infamous beer incident involving a certain mailman named Newman on June 14, 1987, during the Mets-Phillies games. It's an honor to welcome number 42 in your program, Roger McDowell, to the corner. Welcome, Roger. How you doing? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's absolutely our pleasure, especially with what's going to be going on this weekend. You're the perfect guy to talk to for this. Uh, for those of you that are new to our Zoom room, just a quick reminder, make sure you keep yourself completely muted during the beginning of the show. We ask uh, that you, you make sure you do that. After I ask Roger a few questions, what we'll do is we'll turn it over to you. Wait till you're called on. You can use the raise hand uh, electronic feature, or you can do it old school and just wave your hand. Um, so we'll get right to it because I know you must be exhausted, Roger. So obviously our site is uh, out of respect to the greatest post-game show in the history of baseball. You actually got to appear on Kindness Corner a few times. We actually have one of your appearances, the August 12th, 1987 episode. Uh, it's one of the 50 that we've been able to save on our site. Getting to appear on that show, what was that like for you? And what do you remember about, you know, just everything that surrounded it? You know, it, it was, it was pretty special to me um, as a young player coming to New York Mets with the number of veterans that they had on the team. And I, um, gosh, I was, I, I was just enamored with New York as a whole, with the media, with everything that surrounded it. So, you know, I have never obviously been a part of a post game show. Um, and having the likes of uh, Ralph Kiner um, ask me questions uh, post game, you know, Ralph Ralph was around the club, so I mean, he was he was one of us. Um, and so, you know, being being an announcer, you know, him and Bob Murphy and 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 the guys, I mean, it was it was, I guess, a lot of familiarity uh, going in there, and basically, it was it was like what kind of gift do I get? You know, <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like, what do you, what do you get? You know, and then, you know, whether it was, uh, you know, a dinner somewhere, uh, whether it was, uh, you know, a, a watch or whatever it may be, it was kind of like, okay, what, what do I get? What do I get out of this for being on the show and being one of your, uh, when you're one of your stars of the game. So, yeah, I know, I know a lot of guys, uh, you know, look, look forward to it. Um, uh, just to be on that show, just to be around Ralph again. I mean, you know, as I said, we're around him all the time. He was part of the ball club. So it was uh, it, it was nice to be a part of and uh, nice to have made some contribution that I could be a part of that show. Nice. Yeah, the good old Arbitron watch or the Getty gift certificates or the members only jackets. Those were the biggies, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, they, those I, I tell you what, those went a long way, you know. <laughs> Yeah, Maggie Sasser still has one of the leather coats he got. Believe it or not, <laughs> no, I believe it. I, I, I've seen it. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, being part of that magical '86 season must have been amazing. What stands out to you the most when you reflect on that experience and the fact that you're the winning pitcher in uh, the signing Game Seven of a World Series? Well, I guess what stands, you know, looking back, you know, as you get older and you get long in the tooth. Yeah. You, you look back and uh, just cherish what a special time it was. And, and the, the teammates I had, uh, the people I got to play with, the people that shaped me as a baseball player, because it was 86 was my second year in the big leagues. And even though um, I had had some success in 85 and then in 86 became close co-closer with Jesse, um, there's, there were still some 
I wouldn't say doubt, but there was a, still a part of me that was like, you know, any given moment, you're young, you can get sent down. And so, uh, especially with the, the, the veteran ball club that we had, um, I know we had some young guys, but we also had a, a pretty established team. And so, you know, looking back on that, on the, on that season in particular, it was, you know, you really don't, you really don't understand the, the wealth of what happened at the time because you're going through it and it's just, you know, trying to figure out how to win one game each night. And that progressed into obviously the playoffs with the Astros and the, the World Series with the Boston Red Sox, but uh, you know it was it was about winning one game, and that's what it was about. And that's what and that's what our goal was every night is to win one game, and and uh, that game of that evening, you know, it's it sounds a bit cliche, but that was what we looked forward to was the competition on the field and coming out uh, as victor uh, victorious uh, at, at the end of the game. And as far so, as as far as as far as Game Seven goes, um, I got the win. Yes, I did. Um, and I don't want to embellish the fact is that Je- Jesse saved my butt um, <laughs> because they had, I think the, it was the eighth inning. They had a runner on second. The <laughs> time run was at second when Jesse came in to relieve me, and he stranded that guy um, that didn't score, which ultimately. Um, you know, we added to the lead and I got to be, become the winning pitcher because I think I came in the game when it was tied and we ended up scoring a couple of runs and I kind of gave it right back up. Um, but Jesse saved me um, as he did a lot. <laughs> so this weekend's all about Dwight and you got the opportunity to play alongside him. You witness his immense <laughs> talent and his impact on the game. Could you share a specific moment or even just a, a characteristic that set him apart so early in his career. He was just so dominant, you know, <laughs> over and above everything else. Well, it, it, it was real early in his career because he'd just gotten drafted. Uh, we, we were both in the same draft. Um, Doc was number one. Floyd Yeomans was number two. And I was number three. So, um after I got drafted, I went and played at Shelby and Lynchburg, and I think Doc may have went to low, uh, or maybe he went to short season Kingsport um, before he um, came to instructionally, which is in the fall. And instructionally at that time for um, people in baseball was such an honor to be invited to. It was it was it, it meant that you were a part of the future of the team that they thought a lot of you and instructional league was to kind of get a jump start on spring training. You know, that's when um, the manager, the general manager, the front office people came down to watch baseball and you got to, you know, um, put yourself out there in front of the front office and the people that made the, the decisions on careers. And so getting invited to, uh, to instructional league that year in 1982. And uh, I remember when you, you asked about a specific incident, the specific incident in Doc's young career was we were wondering what kind of car he was going to drive up in, in instructional league for his first day at, uh, at workouts. In we were at the, the old Payson complex in St. Petersburg. And I don't even remember the car. But I knew it was beautiful. <laughs> I remember that it was beautiful, and I remember the fact that Doc got out of the car, uh, went in, and uh, got dressed for workouts. We went out and worked out, and he became he was he was just a guy. He was just another one of the guys, fit right in, um, and and we fit in with him. And it was uh, it was it was it was so enjoyable. Um, to look back on those memories because at the time it was, you know, here's the number one pick, uh, he, you know, and at the time it was, you know, he, he got the big money and we wanted to see what kind of jerk car he drove and we wanted to see what kind of person he was. <laughs> and Doc was as genuine as, um, 
anybody that I've ever come across and as um, down to earth as anybody as, as I've ever come across. You know, it's interesting because on the Zoom call last week um, with you, Mookie and, and Dwight, you mentioned something that really struck me because, you know, as fans, when, when you're growing up, there are certain pitchers that, you you know, back in the day for me, you talk about long in the tooth. I mean, back in the day, you know, obviously Gibson, Seaver, but then Mark Fidrich, you know, even Al Roboski, those are must-see guys because it was just something about them that was just so electric. But you mentioned on the Zoom how every single time Dwight took the mound, the relief pitchers would get up on that bench, you know, that oversaw yeah. the, the bullpen, sure. and, and you guys wa wanted to watch so, you know, what is it when a major league pitcher, you know, must watch a, a guy pitching? What was it about Dwight that all you guys had to sit up there and take notice and watch his, his starts? Because you didn't know what was going to happen. I mean, you knew what you knew good was going to happen. You know, he was going to be great. But you didn't know if he would. And, and I think I said on the Zoom is that, you know, those, those people up there in uh, I think it was the left field. Up, up on the left field, uh, upper yeah, the deck. K corner. Yeah. The K corner. And they brought 27 Ks because it might happen. <laughs> and and we wanted to see it as well. And it was it was enjoyable um just from a you know as as a as a teammate to watch Dwight work, to watch Dwight pitch, to white to watch Dwight command the baseball field, to watch Dwight command the pitcher's mound um and then you know as a pitcher you know it's it's something that you you want to emulate it's something that you want to copy because when you go out there you want to have that that same not only charisma but you want to have the, the same the, the same grit you want to have the same um uh life that he had on the mound and you know when it, it was it, it was it was exciting because, you know, every time you got two strikes on a guy, 50, 55,000 people started clapping. 55,000 people started cheering because they know what might happen. It might be a strikeout. And that's why, you know, that's why you got the name Dr. K, because he did strike out people. I mean, you know, if you remember, you know, in his minor league career, he was the first, I mean, I don't know if it's true from a factual standpoint, but he may have been the first minor league pitcher to strike out 300 hitters in a minor league season. And I'm not sure if that's a, a true fact or not, but he did it. You know, he struck out 300, 300 guys in a minor league season. And the minor league season is not as long as a major league season. I think it's only 144 games. And he did that that's at 18, right? 18 yeah. years old. Too. At 18 years old. And so now you talk about fast forward a couple of years and he's in the big leagues and he's doing it to major league players that are established and have been around for a while. Yeah, with that devastating hook, that curveball was sick. But, uh, you know, it's also interesting because you, you take a look at that 86 team and you take a look at, you know, where that 86 team was, you know, New York, the biggest stage. And, and I've said this a number of times, probably the biggest testament to that team is, you know, they're identifiable, identifiable by just – Nicknames or one name. So you got Mex, you got Doc, you got Straw, you got Kid, you got Nails, you got Mookie. I mean, just one one name, and that's it, and everyone knows it. You take a look. Um, you know, Keith's already up there. Dwight's coming this weekend. Straw later this season. I hope soon Gary Carter as well. When you sit back 37 years later and you realize the impact that that team had on this city and this fan base, what's the first thing that goes through your head? Uh, probably just the joy that you had come into the ballpark, knowing that there's fifty to fifty-five thousand or sixty thousand people going to be there on a Monday night playing the Pittsburgh Pirates. <laughs> you know, I mean, it was, it, it was, it, you know, the fans are what made that club. And you know, I'm not speaking for the fans, but I think the club made it for the fans, and it was. It was it was a great relationship, and it's a relationship that's, that lasts. What are we? Almost forty years. Yeah. Yep. It, it's it's, it's still lasting. It's still there. And you know when we come when we come in this weekend, um, you know, and we go around the city, and obviously not 
everybody's going to get recognized anywhere. But if you are, and, and you just mentioned that you, you know, hey, 86 Mets, you know, it's there, there's that connection uh, with the people. I think, I think more than anything, it was the blue collar work ethic. Um, and you talked about the nicknames. I mean, you know, you got Wally, you got Tuff, you know, <laughs> you got Mitch, you know, and, and you think about it and you think about that team. I mean, Kevin Mitchell, okay, who goes on to have a really, really great career. On that 86 team, Kevin Mitchell was the fifth infielder and the fourth outfielder, okay? And uh, there were platoons, and, and that's the other part of, I think, the equation that a lot of people um, kind of grabbed onto is that there weren't there – were, there were stars. Obviously, there were stars on that team. But there were – I think there were four platoons on that team where, you know, from – as you look back from a fan's perspective is, hey, listen, they're stars, but everybody's contributing. Nobody is really – wanting to say you know i'm the guy you know we had a we had a we had a platoon at second base with wally and tough had a platoon at third base with with ray knight and with howard johnson you had a platoon in center field with mookie and lenny and you had a platoon in closer with jesse and i and so there weren't i i guess at the end of the day there weren't any egos and it goes back to what I said earlier. It was about winning one game and how any of us could contribute to that end was what we were trying to do. Oh, unbelievable. Yeah. You know, obviously around this uh, celebration, a bunch of you guys are coming in. What's the thing you look forward to most when you guys all get together, you know, from that 86 team? Yeah. You know, I, I think, I think everybody is uh, very excited to come back and share uh, this moment with Doc, you know, this is what, um, you know, his number being retired and what it means to uh, not only Doc, but the, the fans, the New York Mets uh, and, and the people that um, had the opportunity and the pleasure to be uh, not only his teammate, but also uh, a friend. So your reputation for practical jokes is legendary. Hot Foots, obviously, you know, we, we all love the uh, videos that, you know, you and Hojo made actually how to give a hot foot. Um, I, I think people talk about the upside down Roger more than the actual Hot Foots. Um, can you recount one of your favorite pranks from your playing days? And were there any that you pulled on, on Doc in particular? Uh, you know what? N none really I pulled on Doc because I knew Doc had a, <laughs> I had a practical joker side as well. So I didn't want to get the, uh, I didn't want to get the other end of it when, um, you know, he came back, but uh, you know, I, I, I just enjoyed it. There, there's nothing in particular or um, anything that uh, sticks out. It's just, I enjoyed going to the ballpark and trying to keep things light and keep things fun. Um, but I do remember one thing is that uh, early in my tenure within the Mets, and, uh, you know, I had started to do some of these uh, practical jokes and uh, the manager, Davey Johnson, said, listen, he said, there's a time and a place. And so I've always tried to remember that and made sure that uh, the time and place were, uh, were correct for the situation. So, you know, this is legendary as well. Uh, you know, 86 Mets. Uh greatest team of that decade and then you get to appear on probably one of the greatest shows of the decade Seinfeld that I have to imagine that had to be an unforgettable moment um how did that opportunity come about and what was it like you know all these years later when it pops up on reruns and you see it yeah it's pretty cool and it's actually <laughs> pretty cool and you know when uh actually Keith called me up uh Hernandez Keith Hernandez called me up I think it was the winter of 91 and said, Hey, listen, you want to be a part of the show? We got to fly to New York. And I said, Okay, what is it? And he goes, Seinfeld. I said, Okay, great. I'm in. So, you know, Keith uh, flew from New York. I was in uh, Florida at the time. I flew from Florida. We met out there and went to the set and got to meet everybody. And, you know, at the time, it was, I think it was the beginning of the second season of Seinfeld. So 
and then it, it wasn't what it what it became um but what it became was uh, you know part of part of uh tv history so i was happy to be a part of it Lastly, before we turn it over to the Zoom room, reflecting on your career with teams like the Mets, Phillies, Dodgers, what is your lasting impression of, of your major league career? Is it 86 or, or is it just the totality of your career? Well, obviously the pinnacle would have to be uh, 86 because that's, as a baseball player and anybody in baseball, that's the objective is at the end of the is at the end of the year to be the last team standing. And uh, uh, I, was, I was fortunate enough to uh, be a part of that. And I was fortunate enough to be able to pitch 12 years in the big leagues and with uh, five teams, I believe it was. So you know, I, I, I'm, I'm happy I was hopefully as, as consistent and uh, you know, came to the ballpark every day with a good frame of mind a uh, positive frame of mind and uh, contribute and be available each and every day as a reliever. And that's, that was my job to be uh, available each and every day as a reliever. And, you know, if you got a day off, hopefully doc's pitching that day. <laughs> uh, before I turn it over to the zoom room, I'm sure you guys that are in the room, I'm pretty sure you guys all have tickets. People that are watching on Facebook live tickets for Sunday's game are still available. Mets.com. You know, if you uh, grew up going out to the ballpark to see Dwight, um, it's definitely, I think you need to go out there and, and show Dwight the love. Um, it's his day and it's important uh, for all Met fans that got the opportunity to watch his greatness um, to be there. So I, I know the guys in the Zoom room, I don't have to tell you to be respectful. I know you guys are. Um, you know, we are going to have to figure out a way um, now because I don't know how happy hey, to I, get in. Mark, can I add on to that? Absolutely, Roger. Okay, well, you know, as, as you said, this is Doc's day, and this is this is an opportunity to appreciate Doc, you know, for what he for what he did, um, how he pitched, how he represented, and what he meant to New York. And I think you know, I don't know how many people are on this, but I, I think you know, you tell a friend, you tell a friend, you tell a friend, and next thing you know, you know. Just to have, just to have the support, to, and I and I know, you know, New Yorkers, you know, they're very beloved with their sports figures, and I just, you know, I I want this to be a really really great day for Doc because he deserves it. I couldn't have said it any better. And again, for those that are watching on Facebook, if you know you went to one game in your lifetime that you saw the doctor pitch. And, and you remember it, it I, I really think you need to, especially if you have kids now, man. Uh, I mean, that's what baseball is about also, you know, going there and and telling your kid that, you know, I saw this guy, you know, I remember seeing Willie Mays in the twilight of his career. My dad tell me all about Willie Mays. You know, that that's also a big part of baseball. So I think it's important that you guys go out there and show Dwight the love. So I'm going to turn it over to the Zoom room. You guys can basically... Um, Raise your hand the old school way, or yeah, you guys are all old school. It's unbelievable. All right, Stevie, go ahead, unmute, and go. Hey, Roger, how are you? Good, Stevie, how are you? I'm doing great, doing great. Really uh, nice to see you here. I know this this weekend is about Doc. Um, kind of, uh, Mark kind of stole my thunder there and uh, talking about the hot foot, but uh, I've, I've gotten to know Hojo really well over the past few years. Um, and, and he's told me some stories, but I never actually heard the, the origin story of it and who came up with it and when you started doing it. Well, I think I may have seen it, you know, back in the day, there was really one game on that was Saturday afternoon and, you know, the, the show I think that preceded it was This Week in Baseball. And maybe I saw it on there and I brought it up one day, you know, we were in the clubhouse or talking or whatever. And and, and Hojo says, uh, I, I, you know, I was with the Tigers. I, they did that all the time. I said, well, show me, you know, show me how it's done. And so he showed me how it's done. And, you know, between Howard and I, we made a little adjustments. We made some um, some some key uh, changes 
that when you apply the hot foot, because if you remember, the old hot foot was used in gum. Right. And, you know, especially in cold weather, gum doesn't work because <laughs> gum doesn't stick. And in hot weather, it melts. And so we had to figure out something, how to adhere it to the shoe. Um, and so that's when, I don't know whether it's Howard or I, um, and right next to the dugout is the camera well where the cameraman is. And I picked up, uh, he had a roll of gaffer's tape. And so I pulled off a little piece and I said, this is pretty sticky. So Howard and I got together and I said, you know what? I think this would work instead of gum. And so we started using gaffer's tape instead of gum. Uh, it, it's real tricky because, you know, especially nowadays, I mean, you know, where, where are you going to find a, a, a pack of matches, you know? And so, uh, you know, you had to get the matches, you had to get them, uh, you had to take the staple out to, to separate the two, two layers. And, and then you had to wrap it around the cigarette, uh, but it had to be flexible. So you had to get it flexible first. Then you had to wrap around the cigarette, but you couldn't wrap it too tight around the cigarette because then it would choke the, the, the cigarette off and you wouldn't get air to it. I, I'm telling you, it was, it was it was more complex than what it looked like, okay? <laughs> and so, um, but but it, Howard, I, I was introduced to it by Howard. And between Howard and I, we made some, some adjustments and changes and you know, not that it's perfect or was perfect, but uh, it did its job. That is before the age of analytics, because now I'm sure they'd be able to do analytics on hot foots as well. <laughs> I'm sure. And you could have taught a, uh, a science well, class. At least, at, at least we would have got the wind direction right. <laughs> right. And you could go to All every right. restaurant in the city, and there was a book of matches on the counter, right? And, yeah. and a cigarette machine where you pulled the little plunger to get what are you yeah. talking about? You could probably just go to Keith Hernandez's back pocket. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> All right, uh, Michael, go ahead, unmute. Thanks, uh, Roger. I, I I don't have a question, but uh, just just two comments. First off, I I forgive you for pitching for the Phillies, um, <laughs> and uh, uh, second, uh, I, I said this to Hojo when I met him. It is an honor when you get to meet one of the guys from the '86 team because. You guys were just so special, and uh, you know, you watched you watched the whole team out there, and you could see you guys every time you went out there. You knew you were going to not only win, but you were going to beat that other team down. And you know, it was just a great thrill for me in '86. Like I come from also the '69 era, uh, but it was it was um, it was different. It was you know, you guys were just oozed confidence. And it was great to go out to the ballpark and just see you guys play. And, you know, you kept it light. You know, they had leaders on that team. But, you know, you, you always need the guy who can keep everything light, who can keep it, you know, don't take yourselves too seriously. Yes, win the game. But, and I appreciated all of that. And I just wanted to let you know that. Well, I appreciate that. And I, I, I will tell you what, there's, there is a correlation with the 69 team and it, and it had to do with Doug McGraw. I had an opportunity to uh, meet, uh, early in my career, and uh, to say that uh, that I don't want to say that I followed in his footsteps, but I uh, and it's funny because our numbers are kind of identical. We got traded to the Phillies, um, and or very similar. But uh, I learned a lot from Tug just as far as the levity of being a relief pitcher. But thank you. And, and I, I, you know, for those that didn't get the opportunity to see the the Zoom that the Mets did last week, I think uh, Dwight said that, um, you know, when Roger was on the Phillies, there was the the time where uh, Pat Combs hit uh, Dwight and Dwight went out to the mound. And then it really it was one of those like nasty, nasty bench clearers from straw like, uh, you know, probably would have destroyed every single guy on the Phillies team, you know, had people not pulled him off. But um, Dwight said that Roger had the absolute best line about that brawl. He said, you know what the toughest part was? He said, I think both teams are trying to get to Greg Jeffries. <laughs> it was one of my favorite lines of that Zoom. Uh, Mark, you had your hand up? Old school? All right, go ahead, unmute. Yeah, hell yeah, Mark, how you doing? 
great job getting yeah. Roger on. Roger, nice, nice talking. I'm gonna tell you, 1986, I was 13 years old in the upper deck game seven, Shea Stadium, you know, and then seeing you guys run and you're the only team to when when at the end of this when when the final out when they all run to the mound, you jumped on Jesse, not like jump up and down like this. You jumped, you <laughs> tackled him. <laughs> that's that's how nuts you guys were. I mean, you guys were great, but I'm gonna. I'm going to tell you, um, game six and 86 against Houston. Did you pitch five innings? Yes. Scoreless? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's your, that's your best performance. Do you think? I mean, I'm just curious. I mean, I'm just curious. Okay. I think, I, I think it is. Um, Mike Scott, that whole thing. What was, the, uh, you know, what did, did you, did you see the baseballs? Did you, I mean, I know you're a posing pitch, but, uh, you know, did you, did you see anything? Did you hear any? I'm, I was just curious about that whole thing. Okay. The the first was about the five innings. Yes. Yeah, I I pitched five innings of. I believe it was one hit. I gave up yeah. Kevin. I gave up a, a hit to Kevin Bass in my fifth yes. inning, and Gary threw him out. At second, uh, he was trying to steal, and Gary threw him out. And so it, it's funny because that year, I didn't see being co closers. We had different teams, Jesse and I. So teams that were predominantly right-handed were usually games that I closed on. And Jesse would pitch previous to me, turn kind of turn the lefties and kind of get the manager hamstrung on the other side so that when Jesse came in the game in the seventh or eighth inning, all the lefties, they would pinch hit righties. And so when I came in in the eighth or ninth inning, there was a predominantly right-handed lineup and vice versa with a team that had switch hitters or lefties and Jesse was a guy and I set up. And so that being said, Houston wasn't one of my teams. And I didn't, the times that I pitched uh, against Houston during the season, I didn't do particularly well. I think I, I, I'm not sure exactly how many games, but I remember there was a, when we were getting ready for playoffs, there was a USA Today kind of uh, blurb uh, about the the relievers. And one of them was the fact that I I was either 0-2 or 0-3 against the Astros with like a 13 or 14 ERA. And so they weren't my team. One, they played on the AstroTurf. And two, they had left-handed or switch hitters. And so really the only right-handed hitters they had in that lineup were, I want to say, uh, Billy Hatcher and Glenn Davis. Um, other than that, it was pretty much predominantly either switch hitter or left handers. So Je- it was Jesse's team. So you know when I got the call to come come in and pitch after we tied it up in the ninth off the of Nepper, um, I know everybody was holding their breath and me too <laughs> because <laughs> we were in the Astrodome, obviously away, and they score a run and they go to Game Six and we get to face Mike Scott again that uh, we haven't mm-hmm. beaten twice. He's actually dominated the Mets twice in the series already and not looking good. Um, so I got lucky. Okay. <laughs> I got lucky. <laughs> um, I got to, I got to pitch five innings. Um, I got in that bat. I think it was against Larry Anderson. I grinded out to second base, but uh, I think it was after my third inning and uh, my, my, uh, my place in the lineup was coming up. And I think, you know, as a reliever in the playoffs, you pitch three innings and your place is coming up in the order, you're going to get pinch hit for. Well, that wasn't Davey's idea. And so I think it was one out and I got to hit against Larry Anderson. I granted out. I ended up pitching two more innings, um, gave up a hit to uh, Kevin Bass. I think it was a one out hit. Gary threw him out. There were a couple really, really hard hit balls. I know Keith, had a line drive that, that he snared and uh and he was elster at shortstop uh, made a really good play on a really tough ball so i got lucky you know and, and uh but as far as my best performance as a major league pitcher absolutely that is the best five innings was the most i've ever pitched uh <laughs> given given the given the gravity of now that we know um the situation yeah, I I'm I was very I guess I'm very humbled and thankful that I got that opportunity and was able to to pitch that uh, 
that five innings. But uh, you know, Mike Scott, you know what? He he was dominant, and we'll leave it at that. <laughs> Thank you. It, it, it's so interesting, you know, and listen, we all still love the game of baseball. We still all love the Mets, but that era, the the fact that you went five innings, uh, the fact that you, you're, you're right. You said you, you didn't have success against the Astros, you know, and Davey actually was a guy who, you know, before he was an analytic guy before it's time. I mean, Davey right. actually, you know, went to IBM and, and got reports back in the day when, when he first started playing sure. and, and played under Earl Weaver and talked to Earl and, and, you know, actually spoke to Earl about lineup construction. But in today's game, like we probably, well, with the three batter rule, you know, you would have then seen matchups, you know, every single inning would have been a different pitcher. Um, and not only that, I mean, you look back at that era and just some of the games that you played in the, the July 4th game in Atlanta, you know, switching outfielders, left field, right field, where the balls aren't going to be hit. Um, you know, and, and that game six, I remember I was in the city at that time and, you know, wherever there was a television in a window, there were people, you know, 10 deep into the street, just captivated. Uh, the city was just so focused on the Mets and hopefully we'll get back to that level soon with the Mets. Um, but it was absolutely incredible. I, I agree. It was just, yeah, um, it, was, it was, it was, it was, it was so neat. I mean, uh, you know, you, you watch that documentary 30 for 30 and they show everybody, either gathered, gathered around, you know, a, a, a TV in a limousine with the doors open or <laughs> they're at the, they're at the appliance store with the TVs in the window or, you know, they're watching the ticker, you know, in Times Square or whatever it was. And so, yeah, it was, it was unbelievable. It was unbelievable. Even, and you'd look no further, even the, the let's go meds video with Joe Piscopo with, with the bobbleheads and every single person that was in that Howard Stern, Mayor Koch, you know, uh, uh, all these appearances. What is Cindy Lauper in that? What's that? Cindy Lauper was in that, right? Uh, yeah, I think Cindy was in yeah. it. It was crazy. It was crazy. Yeah, you know what? You talk about you talk about that, you know, 16 inning game, right? <laughs> we we used four pitchers. <laughs> uh, Ojeda, right? Ojeda, yeah. Aguilera, myself, and Jesse. 16 innings. Yeah, it's uh, unbelievable. Yeah, yeah, you, 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 that's like, that's three innings in a major league baseball game today. <laughs> uh, all right, uh, Joel, so you wanted to ask a question, right? You can unmute, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, just on that last point, I think that because of the uh, steroid era afterwards with all those huge home run numbers that you might see a lineup with a ton of home run numbers or guys off the bench with good home run numbers, that team had, uh, for that era, tremendous – uh, you mentioned Hojo and Mitchell. I mean, Danny Heap, like baseball players on the bench. Um, but I, I actually had two questions, and I'll, I'll start with one uh, and we go to that. Um, d d you mentioned Davey with two closers, and it seems to make so much sense to do co-closers. Someone's hurt. Someone's not feeling well. You have that option, but then you had the whole lefty-righty option that you described. And I remember when Davey was the manager of the Reds, he did something similar. It wasn't a lefty-righty. I think it was a sinker baller like you. I want to say it was like Danny Graves and Scott Williamson or something like that. Um, why doesn't everybody do that? Why isn't everybody, instead of going out and spending, I mean, now Diaz is getting whatever, 20-something million a year, and he's, he's fantastic. But why, especially to save money, why aren't a team why isn't team getting a damn good lefty, a damn good righty and and using them relatively equally? You do see occasionally they'll say, hey, I got an Edwin Diaz. I'm gonna bring him in the eighth when I need to. Buck did that in 22. He was a, and he's a rarity. So uh my first question, and I'll I'll leave it till the end till all the people have a, a question before I go my second one, but why you, you were a pitching coach, Roger. Um, you know, why isn't that happening more often? Uh, to answer your question, honestly, I don't know. To answer your question as a pitching coach, it's hard to find guys with that mentality. It's hard to find guys with the closer mentality. With There are guys that, you know, back when I pitched, probably in today's game, that are very secure in pitching the seventh or eighth inning. There's uh, there's a safety net and the safety net is that there's somebody behind them. And so that being said is that 
it's difficult to find those guys. It's difficult to find those guys as a lefty and a righty tandem um, to be able to, to, to close games. And so I think probably that would be my, my baseball answer and my you know, answer uh, in any shape or form because it's, 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 it's difficult to find them. And I don't know, I don't know how else to explain it, but you know, there's a there's a lot of teams that, like I said, that, that have those relievers that are comfortable throwing seventh or eighth inning, and sometimes you see experiments. That, hey, our closer needs a day off today. We'll back everybody up, and it's a different story. And so, I think that I think what it comes down to is difficulty of finding that number of guys that are able to do that. The other part is, is that especially in today's game, different, obviously different than the eighties, even the nineties was that the, the relievers were multiple innings. There were more multiple inning guys and there were more multiple inning guys at the back of bullpens. And I think with the Reds, you know, it might have been Graves and Williamson, but I, I remember the Reds, and I don't know if Davey was the manager or Lou Pinello was the manager in time, but he had three pretty good guys down there in Charlton, Lou um, yeah. you know, Rob yeah. Dibble, and yeah, Randy Myers. Yeah. And so, in all reality, you have three closers right there. And so, when you talk about closing games, a lot of times that game's closed in the sixth or seventh inning. And so from a reliever standpoint or from a coach's standpoint, you find those guys that can shut down a sixth inning, can shut down a seventh inning, can shut down the eighth inning. And then you got, you know, your so-called closer coming in. You know, I had the good fortune to be, you know, in a, in, in when I was a pitching coach, had Rafael Soriano, had Billy Wagner, had Craig Kimbrell, uh, Zach Britton. And it's just the mentality part that separate or is the separator to a lot of relievers. Wow. All well, those guys have great stratomatic cards. Michael, you raised your hand. Go ahead. We, and we, yeah, Roger, we're just going to get a couple more because you've been very generous yeah. with your time. And I, I know that you uh, also have a big weekend ahead of you. So a couple more. Michael, go ahead. Just a quick question. Uh, pitch clock. Are you for or against it? So I, I'm, I, I don't have an opinion on it because I never had to deal with it. You know, as, as a pitcher, I never had to deal with it. I mean, I, I didn't work slowly. I didn't work, you know, I didn't work super fast. I worked in a timely manner. And I, I thought that, uh, you know, if you do that from the standpoint of, and, and, and I was taught from my dad as a young man, listen, you, you throw strikes, you work effectively. You work um, not quickly, but but it's a good pace. What it does, because because I wasn't a strikeout guy. I was a ground ball pitcher, so to speak. And so that's what my dad taught me is that listen, if if you do those three things, your infielders would be more prepared to make plays for you. They're not on their heels, you know, and they're not ball two, ball three. You've worked quickly and and or not quickly but just at a good pace you know i, I don't have an opinion i think uh, you know a lot of things that, um you know, i i think the pitch clock is something that is a part of today's game and it's not something that uh, you know we had to deal with Thank to you. that end, you, you, to that end, you take a look at um, your staffs, uh, whether it be the Braves, whether it be the Mets. Uh, you know, when you you played, you know Jesse. Take a look at how many games he got in. You know, over the last I guess three years, uh, the terminology has crept into the game. It's not only innings pitched, but it's the up downs. You know, you take a look at everything where we're protecting these pitchers, and there are more injuries now than there were before. So I don't get that. What do you think the rash of all these injuries are? I couldn't tell you. You know what? I've been out of the game for five years or so. Um, not that I don't follow it. I 
you know, I, I follow it, but not to the point of, you know, being able to give an, a, a quality answer. Um, it would be just hypothetical. And, you know, I learned a long time ago not, not, not to be hypothetical um, about things that, that, uh, that you're not, uh, that I'm not, you know, able to give a, a definitive answer. So, you know, I, I, I don't know, but, you know, I, I do know that um, from, uh, from the standpoint of, you know, how, how things work, um, you know, and, and on my staff as a pitching coach, you know, you had young pitchers, you know, young pitchers, they get up to the big leagues and it's like, they got a hand grenade in their hand. And they can't get rid of it fast enough. Right. Okay. Now you're talking too quick. Now you got, and then you got some other guys that are like, geez, you're putting me to sleep. You know, you're putting your fielders to sleep. You know, if your objective is to put the hitter asleep, you're doing a good job. But that's not the objective. The objective is to throw quality strikes and execute pitches and uh, and have your, your teammates and your fielders ready for, you know, the ball put in play. So, um, no, I'll leave it at that. All right. Uh, anyone else? If not, we'll circle back to Joel, I think. And Mark. All right. So, Mark, you go and then Joel, and then we'll let Roger go because he's got a, a crazy week coming up weekend. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Um... You had the unfortunate uh, fight with with uh, Greg Jeffries uh, in nineteen at, at the end of nineteen eighty nine. Um, what is your relationship? I mean, I, I don't know if you um, a- afterwards. What uh, did you guys have a Have you guys talked? Oh, I mean, because I know Greg Jeffries had, had a hard time with you know early on what he said and all that stuff. But what what was it after? What was your relationship with him afterwards? It was fine. I mean, you know, you know, after after I left and uh, I went to the Phillies, uh, I think Greg left and went to the Cardinals, and mm-hmm. you know, we said our, our hellos on the field. I mean, it's it's not like the the social media, um, and I don't want to say love affair you players have with each other, but I it's it's it's, it's it, we didn't have the social media back then, um, and you know, if you played on opposite teams, you were the enemy. That's that's just the way it was, and so, um, you know, the thing the thing that I really um, you know, think about then that all these years later is, you know, if I could do it over, I'd do it over. Um, from the standpoint of that, that was the last home game for Gary and Keith, right? And right. so, you know, if I had to do over, I would I would I would uh, take a mulligan on that one and and do it over. And, Thank you, uh, Joel. Joel, you had one more question. And we'll yeah, Roger. With you. Um, during the pandemic, they replayed the uh, LCS in the World Series, which was great. And you got to look back and remind ourselves of what baseball was like in the '80s, uh, of the speed of play, the pace of play, like you talked about. One of the things that I noticed, and I still remember it, I, I had kind of like forgotten that when you delivered the ball, your 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 me- mechanics were were unusual. You you almost like on an angle of your body. It was a very athletic release. Um, and while you're not short, you weren't like now. Every pitcher seems to be six three, two hundred, <laughs> uh, cookie cutter. And 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 as you noted, you were a third round pick. Um, would you have been even drafted nowadays? You know what 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 what? How did you get drafted that high? Is that something that was common back then? And and why isn't that now? I mean, I'm, I, when you watch the pitch, you have a it's devastating sinker ball. Seems to make so much sense to, to get a guy like you, but it seems like every guy they draft is a big giant guy who's throwing ninety five. And uh, I'm going to teach that guy to be a pitcher. That was my yeah. Point. I don't know. I don't. I don't. Oh, I, don't I just want to say I... thank you before I answer. I just want to say thank you because I met you once with my son at a fan event, but you couldn't have been more gracious. So I wanted to thank you before. But now, now I'll shut up and listen. Oh well, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. I, I I try to I try to be as accommodating to everybody as possible whenever I meet them, and hopefully that happens. And you know, and occasionally it doesn't happen. And but I'm thankful that you and your son uh, I got to meet you and your son and have a a, a a great meeting. So thank you. But when I've gotten drafted, I have no idea. I'm I guess I'm glad it was in in the '80s um, because I didn't throw well. It, it, it's different from the standpoint of velocities measured differently now. Uh, velocity, I don't exactly know exactly how, 
But in the 80s, early 80s, whatever it is, I mean, they measured, I think, the, when the ball crossed the plate. Now they're measuring out of hand. So you're, from what I know of, you're probably adding four to five miles an hour on the fastball or all pitches, so to speak. So I don't know if, you know, back then they had the technology to measure it out of hand. You know, maybe I'm throwing 94, 95 sinkers. I don't know. Like, I mean, Familia, you know, he was there, what, he's been in, he was there a while, a couple of years ago. All right. Mark. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Familia, Familia was there for a while. He threw with 96, 97 and, miles. And out. came, and, and came it's, back. Right. And, 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 and even when right. he came back, I think, I think when he came back, he dropped like a mile or two. But you know, yeah, that happens over the so, course of a I mean, career. So I right. don't know. I mean, I can I can tell you this. You know, I I'm not sure exactly what Doc topped out at. I don't know if it was 95, 96, but it wasn't 95, 96. <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. on, not on today's gun, you know. And 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 so from that standpoint, you know, Doc was number one, Floyd Yeomans. Both hard throwers, and I was, I was, I had a sinker ball, um, and why? You know, it, it's it's the change of the times. It's how the guys are um, positioned and and how they're evaluated in draft um, as to whether they're draftable or whether they're projectable or whether they can be developed. And so, I, you, know, you see, a, you see a lot of. Pitchers nowadays that are drafted are they're somewhat fully developed because they're going to you know major college programs and they're being drafted at major college programs and they're probably maybe at the peak of what they are as a, as a pitcher. So I don't know if the longevity is the same. Um, again, I, I I couldn't you know state fact, but. Just looking at longevity of, of pitchers, uh, and with the injury toll that I'm seeing now, I'm not sure that there's going to be another. After four or five guys that are currently in the big leagues, I don't know if there's going to be another 200 game winner, let alone 300 game winner. Right, I totally agree on that. Unbelievable. And and the interesting thing too is, is you know I'll just add to that, you know. All 95 mile an hour fastballs are not created equal. Uh, you yeah. know, th there's a difference. You know, th there's certain fastballs that are just a heavy ball or just the rise or or the the run on the balls. You know, Nolan Ryan, listen, you can take a hundred mile an hour Nolan Ryan pitch and a hundred mile an hour Noah Syndergaard pitch. And I'm telling you, they're not the same. No, I mean, you know what? It's funny. You mentioned a former teammate of mine, Wilson Alvarez, left hander for the White Sox. Okay. I think he threw 88, 89. He went. He went through the, the first time through the lineup with throwing nothing but fastballs and guys missing them. It's a different fastball because, you know, sometimes you see it. Um, and I, I learned that lesson with uh, uh, Mike fulton -Evich. If you remember, Mike fulton was a pitcher I had in, in uh, Atlanta. And before that, he was with the Astros. And I remember in spring training, uh, when I was with the White Sox in spring training and, and uh, we played the Astros and Fulton Evans pitched for the Astros and Robin Ventura um, was up to bat and he uh, took the first pitch, I think it was 99, strike one. He took the second pitch, that was 100, strike two. And the third pitch was 101 that was a pulled down the right field line for a double. And so when Robin gets back in the dugout and I said, I said, Robin, I mean, did you have to cheat? I mean, you know, how much did you have to cheat on that fastball? He goes, I didn't have to cheat at all. I saw the, the ball out of his hand so clearly. And it goes back to what you're saying, Mark. There are different fastballs. I mean, you know, that, that, you know, that, 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 that 100 that you can see forever, as opposed to a 93 that you don't pick up so soon. And so it's 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 not all in the gun. There's there's a lot of there's deception that the hitters will tell you whether they can see it or not. Sid Fernandez. Yeah, Sid, Sid Fernandez. Right. There you go. Yep. Right. Al Leiter, for that matter. Al too. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the big uh, six twelve guy, Chris Young. I right? thought you were going to go with so that. Hard. Uh, right. 
I, I thought you were going to go with Eric Hillman. <laughs> no. No. I mean, or Eric Hillman, him, him too. You know, it, yeah. It, it, you know, Sid Prince, Hillman Sid's a good Sid's a perfect example too. You know? You know, I mean, he threw that ball right out of his chest. It's yeah. hard to pick up. So, Absolutely. Anyway. All right, Roger. Thank you so much. Adios. Uh, I Thank will, you. I'll see you Sunday out there. Looking forward to it. Everyone that's uh, – you guys, we're going to stay. We're going to talk Met baseball, obviously. All you guys that are watching on Facebook, again, people that joined us late, tickets are still available, Mets.com. You owe it to Dwight to get your butt out there in the seat and, and to give him the longest standing ovation possible because he gave us so much. Roger, thanks so much, man. I got, I got one more. Go ahead. I got, I got more re- one more request. You got Go it. I want I want an XL Kiner's Corner sweatshirt like you got. <laughs> well, 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 wait, wait. It's Kiner's Corner dot com. But yes, I will. I will order you one. Uh, I'll get to Matt to get to you, or I'll text you. I will absolutely. And you know what? Guess what? And, and be, I, you I, know who this is? This is only because the guy in the upper left hand corner, Michael Tuller, he uh, said we got to get some Kiner's Corner swag. So we got it, and uh, we're doing it. <laughs> All right. Cool. I'll definitely right. get you. Thank you Roger. Uh, Come to Mets uh, Fantasy thanks, Camp, Roger. Roger. <laughs> yes, <laughs> please. You did it? What's that? Well, we'll make sure that happens. All right. Yeah, we'll we got to sure. get a hold of Doug Dickey and make sure that happens. <laughs> all, right, all right, Roger. I'll see you Sunday. Thank you, guys. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Guys. See you Saturday. You. All right. Saturday. Yeah. Right. All right, guys. Uh, let's talk Mets baseball. Listen, Mark, what a difference a Mark, week makes. Yes, yes. Mark, before I just wanted to, to remark on something, the question that Joel asked. Um, you know, like Tom Glavin did a did an interview uh, a number of years ago, and they asked him if he would get drafted in today's game, and Glavin said, "I would because I'm lefty," but Maddox would never get drafted. Right. Right. Wow. In fact, uh, I think Steve Gelbs had that conversation with Quintana today. And Quintana said that back in the day, he threw 84, 85. He said, you know, 50, 50 shot that he gets drafted, but probably 0% that he would make it to the majors. So that was an interesting tell as well. All right. So uh, what a difference a, a week makes. Listen, you know, I spoke about it last week, not to panic. Oh, and five. It was one in, it was one in five. We had oh, won the second game of the double adder. Um, I also said something that I'm so psyched. Uh, got to put Marte in the second hole. Got to put Marte in the second hole. They did it, and and Marte seems to have responded. Um, Batty, listen again. We yeah. all said, you know, we took the last year. He was a savior, but you know, because he we heard everything about him, and he was terrible. And then everyone wanted to get rid of him. Um, it looks like he's just... back at, and is fielding his really got lot, yes. lot, Huge. lot, lot, lot better. hard work. Uh, um, but to, yeah, yeah. right. Um, listen, and we're starting to win without Lindor hitting. That's also a good sign because Lindor, when the weather gets warm, he's going to start hitting. And listen, I, I, first of all, anyone that's watching in Facebook and you guys also in particular, I, I just got to commend everyone. Listen, the, the Facebook group is growing. We're at like 3,300 people. Uh, it, it grows one to 200 people a day, but it's, it's, you know, and I think it's because Kiner's Corner you know, is a certain age bracket. You know, the people that are coming here aren't those people like you go to some of these other Facebook groups. If a guy goes over for this guy sucks, trade him. You know, there's none of that. Um, <laughs> but for those other groups where people are, are, are ragging on Lindor and said he's not a leader, all you need to know is in that game when the Mets were up by, I think at that point, 11 runs, all right? He ran so hard down first base to make sure he didn't get into a double play. I mean, that's the way the guy plays the game 24-7. Regardless of score, he will come around. I am convinced of that. Um, they're, they're, they're nice signs. Listen, uh, you know, the, the this carousel of these DFAs calling guys up um, right before just, uh, uh, what's his name, Ramirez was, you know, the the legend, uh, Johan Ramirez, is, is done. <laughs> He's traded for cash considerations to the Boston Red Sox. So obviously when he, he comes in against the Mets, if he's on the big league level, he'll probably hit one of us. <laughs> but um, so he's gone. Um, and obviously, uh, you know, uh, Joel's favorite pitcher, Julio Turan, um, refused his assignment and elected free agency. So he's gone. 
Um, the guy today is a great story. Um, number six overall draft pick. Joel posted a, a really interesting story from Major League Baseball.com. I, I believe he actually started, even though he you know played in the, the Frontier League, I think he was actually on the roster of the Ferry Hawks um, before this season started. And then the, the Mets got him. Um, listen, you know what? Kudos to Stearns for, for trying to find these guys. Um Drew Smith, you know, uh, I had a long talk with Drew Smith. There's an article on the website about, you know, what he's done to get back to his dominance. And Drew Smith looks great. Uh, absolutely great so far this season. A lot of good positives to be taken. Listen, 0-5 or 1-5, easily really going into Atlanta on top of it. This could have been devastating. Now you have two back-to-back series wins. Now you come home and you play a very tough, you know, streaking Kansas City Royals team. Um, unfortunately, all these special event days, like the, the closing of Shea and certain, you know, retirements, the Mets, just like the Rangers, seem to always spit the bit on those days for some reason. Um, but and the, the flip side is you take a look at the teams that beat the Mets. They're playing well. The Brewers are still playing well. You know, so it's not like they, they lost to crappy teams. It's a long season with two games under 500. You know, that 10 game increments this last, you know, the last 10 games are five and five. So, you know, I, I think the stated goal was to be competitive. Um, the JD Martinez thing is a little concerning. Um, he said that he only lost, uh, like I think 10 to 15 games last year for the same issue. Um, it's also going to be interesting too. Um, I don't know if you guys saw this today, um, but Montgomery fired Boris as his agent. Um, you know, I think Boris wanted to, you know, hold out for all these guys and all the guys that he held out, they all got a lot less money than they, they thought they were going to get. Um, it's interesting that Montgomery would fire him now after he signed the contract. So that that's kind of odd. Uh, so I don't know so what that's going to mean for Pete down the road. Um, this That is his agent. So we'll see what happens with that. Um, the only thing I will say is that if, if J.D. Martinez was going to be your answer, maybe even if you paid him a little more two weeks earlier uh, to get him into spring training for a normal-ish spring training, maybe this wouldn't have happened. But that's, you know, that's 2020 hindsight. Uh, listen, <laughs> you know, D.J. Stewart's responded the last couple of days too in, in this spot. Um, so maybe you get as much as you can out of uh, DJ for a couple of weeks. And then, you know, Martinez comes here because he will make a big difference in this lineup. But um, you know what? It's a lot better feeling today than it was last week at one and five. Oh. Um, so your thoughts, guys. Uh, anyone want to go first? Well, especially. Yeah, actually. Uh, oh, go ahead. Oh, no, no, go, ahead. Go, ahead. go ahead, Steve. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I, I was just going to say, especially with a 16 4 drubbing of. Of the Braves, you got to feel really <laughs> good about that. So, and and poor uh, Luis Guillorme being uh, put on the mound at the end there and giving up a grand slam. I I actually wanted to touch on one other thing that Roger said, where he said, "I'm not qualified to to make that assessment or that evaluation or things like that." If he's not qualified then every idiot Met fan in of the comments section surely of course. is. <laughs> including, including me. I mean, yeah. that's what people don't understand. Listen, yeah. we're fans. You know, uh, even the guys in the media, they're, they're fans first. I, I have to tell you guys, if you haven't had the opportunity, uh, there's an article that I wrote today from Robert Lipsight, uh, 86 years old. Um, guy had unbelievable recall. He you know, covered the New York Mets spring training in 1962 for the New York Times. Yeah. Uh, he's you know he worked for ESPN, just brilliant. But um, you know, he, he so this is all you really need to know about some of the people in the media. So the third, he only attended three baseball games live in his entire life before he was paid to cover baseball. And the reason was is that he grew up listening to Kurt Gowdy and um, and Mel Allen underneath the you know transistor radio underneath his pillow like so many of us did growing up. And when he got to Yankee Stadium, and this boggles my mind. I mean, this must have been how great Mel Allen and Kurt Gowdy were. 
He was disappointed by Yankee Stadium because it didn't seem as big. The grass didn't seem as green. So the his initial first game left him disappointed. Um, he was a copy boy for the Times, and I guess it was cheaper to send a, a you know a, a young cub reporter down to cover the 1962 Mets. Um, and he talked about you know the Dick Youngs of the day and Stan Isaacs. Um, really fascinating guy, and you know I hope the piece did him justice. But if you get a chance, give it a read. But you know I, I, I sit in the press box, and, and some of these guys never played the game, um, never coached. Uh, you know, and listen, you know. You guys probably know more in your little pinky than some of the guys that write on a daily basis. Obviously, the people on, on Facebook and Twitter and all that is just nuts. And thank God we've we've stayed away from that in our group so far. But as you saw tonight, uh, you know, that's that's uh, I, I think we need to come up with a better system where it's more of an RSVP based thing um, yep. or a mailing list. So I know the email addresses because um, once I post it out there, anyone can cut and paste it and, and somehow it gets out there and you get an idiot like you got today. And unfortunately, I, I probably bumped two people. They might have been idiots, too. I didn't recognize them. They didn't go on camera. So and, and they didn't try to get back in. So. Um, but that's crazy. That, that's the world we live in. Um, Sal, you wanted to say something, right? <laughs> I guess I did. <laughs> now, I would just want to, after the last couple of days, I just want to give a big in your face to those guys on FAN because you know what? Uh, don't, don't start. You it was early. <laughs> we told you it was early. And now BT is talking the same thing about the Yankees. And it just makes uh, me makes me nauseous. It's, but it's clickbait. That that's what oh, they're yeah. paid to oh, yeah. do. You know, Let's and, not even and talk they about cater. Them. Right. Yeah. It, Moving right. on. <laughs> exactly. Listen, no, my no, but, but, but that's but, literally why they say these things, right? To try to get people to talk but, about them. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's why they repost it constantly with the Odyssey app, you know, the, they take the little yeah. snippets, you know, uh, Brandon Turner, he goes, you know, ballistic on, you know, it, it's, yeah, I, I do not, you know, if someone, the, every post gets pre-approved, if someone's posting that, and also that now there's a, a whole bunch of like, I don't even know what it is, where like these fake websites write these stories with the most ridiculous headlines. Mm -hmm. And then if you click on it, it's just like spam, spam all over the place. And, and they infiltrate every single group on the net. It's crazy. But what do you think? They so, so bringing this all back, I just wanted to say something to you, Sal. I was really disappointed you didn't wear a rally cap. <laughs> no, I had this one, but I had to work late, and I wanted to burn it. Uh, 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 that's not a rally uh, cap. Uh, <laughs> this no. is the hot foot. That's cap. toilet paper. <laughs> no. We talk about the hot foot. Let's get the king of the hot foot. Yes, we did. Yeah. We he he told us he gave us in great detail how to actually do one. So it's oh, crazy. Gaffer's <laughs> tape. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's a video in that video. Yeah. So um what do you think about honor of Roger? I expected a rally cap. I didn't <laughs> that's you didn't, what Hojo. So it disappointed Hojo. me. <laughs> Hojo <laughs> rally cap. But B yeah, Joel. What do you think yeah, about that? Okay. Yeah, we, we talked about so that. It's it's no, I, I, I Sal's been done for about 10 years, but that's he no one's told him. <laughs> <laughs> um uh, well, go ahead, Joel. A quick comment before before taking your bait on Julio Tehran. But um, I think <laughs> Montgomery uh, fired Boris because I want to say there's a player opt out. I want to say he signed a two year, twenty five million per, and he's sending the message of I'm opting out and I'm going to get myself the contract that I probably wanted to take. And yeah. and you know A Rod has somewhat like thinly veiled said publicly, don't listen to your agent players. They are looking. Their job is to get you every last dollar, but in the end, you should be picking where you want to go. And Boris probably on a mathematical level maximizes the dollars for the guys, but it's high stakes poker. He holds them out till February and most of them then get enormous contracts, but some of them wind up like Conforto or, I mean, there's, there's better examples than that. I want to say Jody Reed or somebody where, where you wind up getting nothing and, and you could lose. All. I always wonder like, does the guy have his own, is it even legal for him to say, hey, if you get screwed, I'll, I'll give you 100 million out of my pocket? You know, it's almost like hedging, <laughs> like a hedge fund, because Montgomery could have signed a deal for way over 100 million dollars. And, um, you know, maybe he turns down 110 or 120 because he wants 175. I mean, the, the numbers I might be off on, but. Um, uh, and, and that seems to happen every year. And then it happened with four guys this year. But I, I did want to comment on, on Julio Tehran. 
it's not that I love the guy. I really never liked the guy um, as a pitcher. I mean, he was, he was fine. He destroyed the Mets sometimes. But I don't understand why they caught him. Is it is it a it was it a space? I understand why they cut Tonkin. I understand why they cut Ramirez. Uh, I don't know why we signed those guys in the first place. But Tehran, his first start, he looks competitive. The bad inning he had, as I commented online, was a couple of bad pitches. Maybe a couple of times he was squeezed. We can't use a veteran like that, even no, as a so, so, man. So uh, no, I'm going to tell you why they did it. So basically, all right. With, you know, not counting the weather because you never know what the weather is going to do. But the Mets had um, 15, was it 14 games in 15 days, right? right. The bullpen was taxed. So what they do is Taran pitched. He wasn't going to pitch again until five days. They DFA'd him, designated him for assignment, which means, you know, they might have had a conversation with him before and say, listen, we're going to send you down. And, you know, if we need the fifth starter the next time around, we're going to call you back up or we want you to go back down in the minors, work out a little more, and then we're going to call you back up. I don't think they initially just cut him outright. I mean, a DFA doesn't mean you're cutting him outright. It means that if he clears waivers or accepts the assignment, he goes down to the minors. He opted out at that point and said he became a free agent. So the same thing with the other the, the pitcher that pitched two innings yesterday. Um, or two days ago, they weren't going to use him again. So they wanted to bring an arm now. That guy, you know, they did the same thing, but he went back down. So, I, you know, we don't have Billy Epler and we couldn't have put him on the uh, 10 day disabled list. So we had to do this. So I, I think that's the, I, I think that's the issue. It must be the issue because he, you know, didn't accept the assignment and declare himself a free agent, which is kind of odd. Um, this is now the second team that, you know, is giving him an opportunity to stay in the system and come back up. So I agree with you. I, you know, he had two really good innings um, and the, the third inning kind of fell apart on him, which, you know, could happen to anyone. Um, Quintana looked good. You know, they still need to get, they need to get six out of these starters. And, and this has been two years we've been saying this, mm -hmm. um, but I, I think it's all of baseball. It, it is really unbelievable. There are just so few pitchers that can get you into the sixth or seventh inning. Um, and, and your bullpens are just going to be on fumes. Uh, you know, back in the day, you, you needed probably like 15 to 18 pitchers. Now you need like 25 to get through a season. It's, it's mind boggling. It really is. You know, on that subject, Mark, um, I, I know you, and I think even Michael has in, in the past, we're, we're mentioning Lucchese a lot and, do you know the rhyme or reason why you know, with the injuries and with the bullpen situation and things like that, that he hasn't been given that shot? Well, they, they, have, they, can't bring him, they can't bring him back up, I think, until tomorrow, correct? Oh, right. the 12th, right. right. Yeah, right, 12th, right, right, right. So that'll well, be listen, interesting to see. I think also the fact that, you know, maybe um, Jose Budo, you know, they might have, looked at him at a higher end option than Julio Tehran. Maybe that was also entering into that thinking um, that that's going to be interesting. And listen, you know, maybe they got a, a more positive report on McGill that he'll be back shortly. Uh, people also freaked out when the, they put Seng on the 68 DL, but it was retroactive and he it's wasn't going to be yeah. back. Yeah. And he's still working out. That's, that's fine. Right. Um, you know, the, the one thing, and, and you know, I, I did want to go back and, and, you know, it's, I have a, a little post-it that I want to go back. And, and Sal, you'll probably remember this. Probably all you guys are going to remember this. Do you remember the year of collusion with the free agency where no free agents were being signed? One of the biggest free agents of, of that time was a Montreal Expo superstar, Tim Raines. Because Tim Raines was a free agent and didn't sign with his original team by a certain date, when he did re-sign with the Expos, he couldn't play, I believe if I remember correctly, for the first 30 days of the season. Oh, yes. I, he played against May, the May Mets. first, the first yeah, game, May, and if I remember Mets. correctly, went three for four with a triple, a du like he like a home run. He like, he, the Mets. Him. Yeah. like he rolled out of bed, right? He <laughs> rolled out of bed and hit six sixty seven, and and had an unbelievable first month. Now you look at JD Martinez, and this poor guy is taking shots, and and he's hurting from swinging bats, and and, and you know, it, it just and, and these and, and it's funny. Uh, my wife came home and I'm watching the game and, and she asked me this question. She goes, do you think these guys are better athletes than back in the day? 
I go, absolutely. And she goes, why? I go, because these guys are like finely tuned machines. I, I said, take a look at any one of these guys. Show me, other than Daniel Vogelback, one Babe Ruth body in, in baseball. All right. And, and I said, not only that, as great as that era was, you know, they didn't play against African Americans. They didn't play against Hispanic players. They didn't play against guys from Japan. And it was a very limited talent pool. Um, so in an they didn't era, smoke or drink in the dugout either. <laughs> right, right. In, in, in an group. era, in an era where these guys have all this sports science and, and work out, and don't have to have a second job in the off season, like how does this happen to a JD Martinez? Like that he ramped, like you have all this technology, obviously, if you're going to take 400 swings in, in five days, you, you're going to have all sorts of muscle pain like that. I still don't get like where the, the off season plan. Like I know he was working out. In, in fact, Joel, I, I don't know if you're aware of, of the fact of where they were working out, where he worked out. His alma mater is where the Maccabee games took place that field. That's where J.D. Martinez was working out all summer long, where we played this past summer. Um, but he was working out all, all summer, you know, all off season. I mean, um, and then he ramped up and, and he's got this back issue. But they, they're saying it's not a big deal, the, the shot. But listen, we might not see him uh, till mid-May. Uh, you know, I, I don't know when we're going to see him. Mark, I, I, I'll agree yeah. with you that they're better athletes. But I don't know that they're that they're better, and I'm going to use this term, baseball players. Now, what I mean by that, what I mean by that is these guys put on muscle to get ready for a season. But if you look at back in the day, in the in the days of Seaver, you know Kuzman, those guys, they don't stretch enough. I don't know that they prepare themselves on a day-to-day -day basis to take on the rigors of the game like they used to. When have you ever seen pitchers, you know, you got you got Seaver who had what, 28 complete games one year? I mean, something well, like that. Uh, well, 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 but, also, but you also had you know, you know, what I also marvel what, what one other thing is that, that I also marveled at is that you know, you didn't have that many backup catchers. How many games did Grody play? back in the day that he took you care are, of, took care of those pitchers i mean i just think two, i just think I, they were gonna, better prepared on a daily basis than they are today i'm going to tell you um two you reasons no i don't think you're nuts but i'm going to give you two words that that made the next generation different and it's marvin miller so because you have the unions and, and the the amount of money these guys made jerry grody you know, there were no guaranteed contract. You know, back in the day, there was no free agency. You didn't right. take off a day because you didn't want some guy taking your job. Doug Flynn tells the story that when he was a rookie and he was out there playing second base in, in spring training and then went into the trainer's room, you know, the, you know, and when he came out, Joe Morgan put his arm around him, walked him to his locker and says, don't ever go in the training room again. You know, if the coach sees the manager sees you, He's going to think you're you're you know one of these fragile ball players, and you're not going to get in the lineup, and you're not going to play. Uh, it was a different mentality then. It doesn't make it you know better. Um, these guys are now multi million dollar investments of the team, so the team oversees. Also, if there's a little tweak, these guys because not only that, listen, you have an intercostal right back in the day, you would have played through it because you don't want you know uh, listen. You don't want um, Babe Dahlgren taking over your position at first base. You know, Wally Pipp sure didn't want to, you know, if he knew what was going to happen back in the day, you know, he got hit in, a, in the head a couple of weeks and he was seeing double vision. And that's why he took himself out of the game. But back in the day, you never took, listen, in, in Gehrig's first game, I believe, um, running to second base, he got hit in the head. All right. And I'm not sure if that was, I remember that because it's pride of the Yankees or because it really happened. Uh, I know it wasn't pride of the Yankees, but he got hit in the head and, you know, he was not coming out of that game because you come out of a game, someone else has the opportunity to take your job. Um, so I don't know if, if that answers your question. I think the reason was back then that these guys played through injuries, you know, Tom, listen, these guys, Tom Seager, 
Juan Marichal threw 16 innings. Like, like that's crazy. Think about it. Yeah. That's insane. You know, that would never happen to you. Yeah, Joel, go ahead. Well, I'm going to use this to circle back to the first topic you brought up, which is Lindor. Going going out there 160 games a year. Going in front of the quarters 160 nights a year. I don't even appreciate that, but I know the players point out, oh, we appreciate this guy who takes the media bad days, good days, you know, every day, day in and day out. I mean, I don't want to pick on people, but like Carlos Beltran, I, I rarely saw him interviewed. Um, they had 22-year-old Wright and Reyes being interviewed every night. But Lindor goes out there every night. I, the, 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 uh, on the field, yes, we all know he starts slow. Um, I, I have some frustration. I wish with two strikes, he's uh, left-handed. He'd, 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 he'd lace the ball uh, to left. We, 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 we should maybe have a conversation about uh, about him right-handed versus left-handed talking about it. But off the field, you see him working with the players, with the young players uh, leading up to the you know spring training, uh, working with the media. But, but here's a dude playing 160 games a year. That's the equivalent of a pitcher nowadays throwback doing 240 innings. But you don't see that. Right. Well, I just, and I just everybody on this call knows how hard it is to – to play eight right right and, <laughs> yeah i know that and how we wait. feel after those eight games. Wait, 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 wait wait steve is that eight innings or eight games right <laughs> depending if like, i get injured or not we, so, we, so we, all, is... we, we all have two words for you mark and they're not happy birthday <laughs> <laughs> so listen I, I mean what lindor does there's so many things he does that do, you, you don't see all right and, and i'm trying to make yeah. this point like lindor will come out of the dugout to go take bp as he sees me you know walking to bp he says i don't even have to ask him he said i'll catch you after bp okay like you don't even have to ask him then he'll go every day the mets have certain groups out on the field you know to watch batting practice after he does his interviews with me and whoever else you know the spanish media he'll do like four or five in a row then he'll walk over and he'll sign autographs, then he'll go out and take his infield, and then he'll work with other guys, showing him certain things. I mean, listen, I don't want to make this Met Yankee thing. You know, obviously Derek Jeter was a great player, but if the Mets would win one or two championships during this 10 years that he's got remaining in his contract, he could end up being held in that esteem if he puts up numbers. He Because he just... He gets it. He really does. He's he's a stand-up guy. Listen, he had that moment, you know, with Baez. You know, he had the moment w with McNeil. Those were a little, you know, early. I think the pressure of the big contract coming to New York for the first time, it could eat you up, man. I mean, there's a lot of guys that this town is, is you know, chewed up. You know, you take a look at guys that had success, like Matt Harvey, you know, Noah Syndergaard. You know, they kind of – quick and, and gone and burnt out and, and didn't have great relationships. Uh, and and I'm, I'm telling you now, I, I don't wish it on him, but I'm going to tell you by season's end, there's going to be another one that's going to eventually blow up with the media. And that's cross town with the Bronx. Um, former Met, I, you know, I just, um, you know, there's something about him, just his attitude. Um, I, I think, um, it's going to be an issue with the Yankees. Uh, with uh, well, what? Wow, I'm getting old. I, I'm Stroman. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, Everyone knew what I was talking about. Yeah, Marcus Stroman. It, it is, you know, it, it, if he is one and four at a certain point this season, it's going to get ugly with him. I think. I, I just, oh, yeah. Um, yeah. It, there's just something about him, even when he was with the Mets, and just. Uh, it, Certain guys I don't think can handle this city. Uh, it, it is tough. And, and you know, if you're on social media, it gets tougher. It's um, not great. So, uh, but, yeah. Yeah. Going back to Lindor, it's a, it's about the contract. The moment he gets into a slump, oh, he's going to pay all that money, you know, that stuff. <laughs> As if he's going to bat 8 800 all the time. Anyway, he's not this, he's not that. My brother was on, was, was, was on uh, Brandon Tierney. And and then you know, he was he was on the show, and then my brother had a nice call. He brings up at the end to to tyranny that 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 Lindor was according to this one thing was the second best shortstop in baseball. 
Now Tierney goes, no, I, I like that. And then, I, and then hangs up. Now he, I don't know if he can. Now, I, now I think there's like Mookie. I think isn't Mookie best now with shortstop? Is he doing shortstop right now? Yeah, yeah. But listen, he's a thirty thirty no, 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 guy, no, 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 a no, silver no, slugger. No, no, no. I mean, how can you argue with that? He's My not point a great is this: though, you, you can't just go no like of that. Of course not. The right. guy that, that, was, that was stupid, Tierney. What happened was, what happened was they actually had had like cut. They actually Clint, cut Clint, off Clint, my brother. Clint. Yeah, no, it was you know, yeah, it was like it would be second. He's a he's a silver slugger, 30 205 RBIs the last two years. Play stellar I, defense. Yeah, I mean, what I mean, yeah, he's one of the best. So it's like, no, he's not. I mean, just people just I, I just say social media is very nauseating. Fire Mendoza, <laughs> 0 and five. And then I'm going to tell you something. I'm very happy that the Mets didn't sign Carlos Correa because now you have Brett Beatty. Now, it's still early on. Who knows how good he's going to be? But Correa had 65 RBIs in 135 games last year. He could have had more than that. I mean, to me, for a 12-year deal, whatever the deal was. I mean, you know, sometimes it's a deal that they actually don't make or that it falls through. So I I want to you know get 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 that, too, and interject it here, too. I mean, he's, he's looking really good. And then who who helped him? Lindor. Didn't Lindor yeah. help him in the offseason? Yeah. yeah. So I mean, it's it's you know he's not a he's not he's been great here except for the first few months of twenty one. He's been great. I mean, you know, you know, Beltran wasn't great the first year, you know, but then he he wound up being pretty, you know. It's I don't know. It's just, it's very, it's just everyone jumps to get it's it's the contract, the contract, the contract. You know, let's stop. I, we, we know that. But after a while, you know, I mean, one guy wrote when last year, oh, he's gonna be a shortstop now for the next nine years. After he was he was struggling. I was like, what, what are you, whatever. I'm like, I just, you're like this. It's just, it's, it's early in the season. Mendoza, he stinks. I'm like, you know, how about, you know, you're never going to hear, you're never going to hear someone say, I'm wrong. You're never going to hear, just, they're just going <laughs> to, no, absolutely. No, you're going to, I think uh, the big part of channeling is inner mad dog. <laughs> yeah. I mean, no, but, you know, I mean, I hear a tyranny. No. First off, tyranny said that. Don Mattingly was a way better hitter than Keith Hernandez. He was a better hitter with more power, but he wasn't way better. Hernandez won an MVP and and a, a batting title too, like like Don Mattingly. I mean, he wasn't way he was he was a little better. He wasn't way better. I mean, it's just well, come on, T. I mean, I mean, like way better. Way better is Mattingly up against a guy who's batting two fifty. You know, you, you know. I mean, it's just where you where you get way better. I mean, it's just you know, shut up. Or you let well, here's one one other thing. <laughs> You let him win by getting yourself so upset. That was his goal. Right. And here's the other thing. Here's the other thing that people don't realize. Like, you take a look. You know, FAN is now the Yankee station. They're not the Mets station anymore. That's also a big part of it. The whole Pete Alonso's a cancer. This guy's – yeah. It's all part of the whole game. Right. Exactly. Yes, Al, go ahead. The thing that has really impressed me, you know, Lindor comes over here, big contract. You know, everybody's got that thought. And he did not have a great year. I think what really has got me impressed is he's taken the fact that, okay, I have this on me. I have to be a leader. And he has become a major leader to where, you know, maybe he gets to wear the C on his jersey. I mean, he, he, like you said, and we've seen it over and over. He finds these guys, the young guys, he works with them. Um, He doesn't back down when he has a bad game. He's like right there. So he absorbs a lot of the stuff for these other players too. I mean, and that that's the definition of a leader. And you can say what you want about the guy, but he has really grown into the role here with the Mets. Totally agree. Totally, Mark, totally agree. I, yes. I, I think you could dedicate a whole show to, if we can speak frankly, the problems with the Met fan culture. Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh yeah. Because I I I'm not embarrassed to tell you, uh, my big brother's a Yankee fan, and after years of him helping me out to get to pay for my, you know, help me out with my Met tickets when I was, I, I started being a Met season ticket holder when I was 18, and so you know he'd give me a few dollars, front me some money at the beginning of the year, and then in '95 after the strike, he's like, all these years I've been I've been you know going in for a quarter share, or whatever. You're going in for a quarter share for the Yankees. So okay. And oh, by the way, I got to see, I can't tell you how many great playoff games. And I, I'm, I'm not a Yankee fan, but I love good baseball. And and Yankee fans can be ridiculous and brutal too. But when but their beloved players, their leaders, they support no matter what. 
I went to a St. Louis game once, but just in one night, I could see how the St. Louis Cardinals treat their icons. I don't mean the old guys. I mean their current guys that may have only been in the league for two, three, four years. The mistreatment of a guy who, 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 who spends time with the fans, who spends time in the media, who plays every day is utterly ridiculous. I, I'm, I'm, I, it's, it's a, I don't want to talk about the culture. I just hope one night we do that because it's a cultural problem with Met fans. On that note, are, Met fan, are more Met fans going to cheer for him tomorrow night after the call by Cohen, or are there going to be uh, enough booze to drown that out? You guys know what I'm talking <laughs> about, right? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. I mean, and you take a look at social media, like, you know, you let him hit, then we'll cheer for him, and then they started ragging on Cohen. Listen, you're right. Uh, but the thing is, I think, you know, I think it's twofold. I think, you know, Met fans of a certain age are not like that. I don't believe that our age group are like that. Because listen, we went from 69, you know, all right, we had 73, we had 2000, we had 2015, you know, we had made the playoffs under Buck. You know, we know that there are lean years. We we get that. We've been through a lot of them. Um, But there's a whole generation that really don't know of any success, just like miserable heartbreak. And they're miserable people. They, they become miserable. I think they're drawn drawn to the misery for some reason. I, I, think, I think it's think the latter. That, yeah, I think what well, they're both uh, they're miserable I, I, people. I think they're miserable. To... I don't think it's their age. I, I know plenty of these 45 and 55 year old miserable Met fans that uh seem to enjoy pointing out how bad they are. See, like I told you so. I know they're gonna be bad. I mean, there's times you're positive, there's times you're negative. It, yeah. that's fine, but they they it, it's it's so much negativity. I'm sorry to cut you off. Yeah. Right. No, I agree. And, and and that's the one thing that worries me is like if I'm Pete Alonzo and I have a choice to go somewhere, why would I want to sign a big contract here where I know that if I have one bad game, I'm going to hear it. My wife, when she's at the all-star game, is going to be ridiculed, you know, that she gained weight. Like, come on. I mean, it's crazy. I, like, I. Why would you want to put that on yourself when you can make the same money somewhere else, probably with a good team that has this equal opportunity to win a world championship and be under the radar and and, and go into a town where, you know, you don't have to put up with this crap. You know, uh, you know, kudos to the guys like like a Nimmo, the guys that resign here or the Diaz, you know, more power to listen. Diaz took a lot of crap. In it, and I don't know if you guys remember, like on the radio show, mm-hmm. I kept on saying, listen, I had a feeling for me it had to do a Empty stands, not the same adrenaline for a closer. And B, the year that he was not having a good season was a year where they changed the seams on the ball, where he wasn't getting the same bite on that slider. They went back to the, the seams being raised and back to the fans, and he became Diaz again. Um, again, we talked about Kelnick at, you know, forever. Like, he's a prospect, which means he's also a suspect. He's now on his third organization. Yeah, he started off hot. He didn't look so great in the one game, and I'm not going to go there. You know, I'm not going to take his 529 start as he's a superstar. I'm not going to take the one game. But listen, it, it's he's on his third organization. Um, Braves will probably become a superstar because that's what the Braves do somehow. Um, but that's just it. Like, it, it takes a certain mentality to – accept that challenge of you listen the elite players can get that money anywhere you know and it's the guys that choose to come here um and and i think that might have been a little part of the reason why Degrom left too you know um why did he need that you know he's he can be a great pitcher anywhere why does he need to be here um and that's a that's an indictment on a fan base and i don't think they get that you know when your star player who was you know raising your system can get the same money here. Well, it's not the same money because in Texas there's no, you know, you know, income tax. So it is a little different. But Mark, um, to but your still. point, that rarely happens. When you're a player and you have you have already signed an extension. So you haven't been in your organization for five or six years. You've been there for eight or nine years. Right. And you're a and you're a godlike. For you to leave your organization, that would be an interesting analysis. How rare that is. It's rare. But 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 I, what definitely happened, and I, I've asked a lot of guys, a lot of former players, um, how about the guys who have never been here, the free agents, who might come here because of the money, but so many of them are like, I don't, I don't need to deal with that. How many free agents could we afford, could we use that don't come here because of the fan base? Absolutely. 
And, and I don't think Scherzer got enough credit for embracing it and wanting, like saying, listen, this is a place where you, if you can make it, you know, this is the biggest stage, you know, got some guys embrace it. Some guys shy away from it. Verlander wanted to do it. Um, but I think Verlander might have been disingenuous. I think Verlander wanted the money. I, I'm not so sure that he really wanted to be here. You know, sometimes you say things, but Scherzer definitely wanted to be here. Scherzer bought his house on Long Island. I mean, he really wanted to be here, and it took all the Mets convincing to have him accept the trade because he really did want to win here. Um, that being said, it is, you know, there's so many, you know, and, and that's just it. I'm, I'm scratching the surface each day of thinking different articles to write because it's, it is a lot of fun. Um, it, it's so much easier just focusing on the, the one team, the one sport, as opposed to when we're doing radio and having to get a different guest every week and preparing an interview for that. Uh, I'm really in, in the fact that the, the community is growing really has made this special so far. So again, thank you guys. And, you know, we got to figure out also um, if there is, listen, I, there's like two schools of thought with the metamorphosis. Some people love it. Some people hate it. Uh, <laughs> I got no problem. If people hate it, I can stop it. If people like it, I'll continue to do it. I got no problem. I, I'm a big boy. My feelings aren't hurt. So feelings on that. You guys like it, hate it. I only hate it because I can never figure it out. Yeah, I can. I, never, get, I, can I always get one, but not the other. I can get one, but not the other. Yeah. Yeah. Some of the guys you went into they, the annals for some of those guys. Holy well, in the begin, well, in the beginning, they were themed, and, and Joel had sent a lot. Joel had some great ones, too. You kind of make them like themes. So they were like ex-presidents that, you know, if you took the two names or, you know, they had something similar, like there was Josh Smoker and uh, who was the other one? Um, Smoker, I forgot. It. You know, then I wanted to do uh, there's Tommy Her and whatever, but whatever. They, but now, like, like people said... <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, Mark. I think it would be better uh, if you added a hint. Well, I did the one because, the, with interestingly enough, Barry Lyons and David Lamb, when you combine them, still look like Barry Lyons. They their face is <laughs> very similar. I saw and I Barry Lyons no, right away. Well, you take a look Dang. at David Lamb. I mean, it, it, it's crazy. So. That one, I said, all right, I had to give a hint. And I said, this would have been better if it was on March 1st or March 31st, because lion and lamb. You know, March comes in uh, like a lion, goes out like uh, a lamb. Okay. Uh, so that's why. <laughs> so that was the hint. Um, I yeah, wouldn't so, have gotten that. I'm too damn yeah. for that. <laughs> well, also, David Lamb, I think, played three games for the Mets. So it, I it's was going to say, what the hell is mean, David Lamb? <laughs> yeah, baseball yeah. Kind of so guy. now I'm doing much more, more you know, um, mainstream. And I'm trying to keep them. Like on Monday, it might be two pitchers. Tuesday, it'd be two catchers, but whatever. But we're also trying to figure out what you guys really want. Like what other content can we put out there? Listen, we do the articles. We we do the beat the streak. We, you know, uh, Brett does the, you know, have we met like little known Mets and he does the Wax Museum. I don't think we have many more of those. We say, yes, a whole bunch of guys, you know, in, in spring training, their first baseball card or from the book. So we have some audio of that. Um, I'm trying to find a lot of these classic Met things. I don't know if you guys saw today. Uh, it, it was fascinating, uh, just absolutely fascinating. When I was doing the research on the Robert Lidsight piece, he hosted a show on ESPN Between the Lines with Howard Cosell. It was the life and times of Howard Cosell. And, you know, Howard hated Casey Stengel, hated Casey Stengel because of the way Casey Stengel treated, treated young players. But Lipsight loved Casey Stengel, so I was able to use that in, in his questioning about it. But in the clip, not only does Howard talk about his hatred of Casey, but then he brings up for the first time, he reveals to Lipsight that he goes and he, he goes, I've never told this story before. And this was 1991. The show aired. He goes that Bing Devine at the time had approached Howard because he knew he had a relationship with Gil Hodges. If he, if Bing, if Howard could ask Gil Hodges, if he'd be interested in the Met job while he was still under contract to the senators, Bing Devine said he couldn't do it because it would be tampering. Howard Cosell did speak to Gil Hodges and reported back to Bing Devine that he would be interested. In, and that's why wow. they eventually made the wow. trade. And, and Lipsight, Lipsight called Cosell on it and said, like, yo, you realize what you did is totally unethical. You got I posted the actual, you know, interchange and it, it's fascinating. It is just unbelievable. That's awesome. Um but there's a lot of these things that like you wow. don't know, like you come across and it, it's unbelievable. Like the other thing, which also like the, the Met time tunnel that I posted, I think three or four days ago, 
the 1983 old timers game. All right. Was <laughs> a tribute to the 1973 Mets. Okay. Tom Seaver had pitched the night before eight innings. Okay. They had wow. Tom Seaver pitch. They, wait, they had Tom Seaver pitch to the first two old timers in the game as an old timer because he was on the 73 team. Like, <laughs> that's, like that's nuts. That's yeah. nuts. That's crazy. Buzz stuff. Capra yeah. was in for the Mets. Buzz Capra was <laughs> fantasy camp coach. Buzz Capra was was there. Bill Robinson when he was he was with the Phillies. Bill Robinson had retired that year, whatever, with the with the Phillies early on. And then he became a Phillies coach for that one year. Then the next year he was he was the Mets coach. Mets then, coach, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Up until Rusty, Ru- Rusty played for the old timers, even because it was a, a seventy three mm-hmm. team, and so yeah. two of the seventy three guys were still in the Mets. So Rusty played in the old timers game as well. You imagine if either one of them got hurt in that game, just as a fluke, I, or or if the social media was around those, those days, it's crazy. So, all right, guys, great night. Uh, how many of you guys are going to the game on Sunday? Great. Awesome. All right, so we've got a bunch of guys going. All right. Uh, I'll have to edit that ridiculousness out of uh, this oh, show. Yeah. When it's posted. Oh, I don't want to see it. Oh, it was bad, Sal. <laughs> not only that. that I'm, I'm ah, trying you to get really don't, Sal. Right you really don't. You don't want to see Like, what? I just, you talk about mentality. Like, what What would, you know, someone sitting around trying to f- hack into a Zoom, like, what? what's the, the point? The, of that? The, the same mentality of the guys that just sit around and, and find any reason to bash the Mets. It's, it, it, it's, <laughs> not their, it's their own entertainment. Yeah. Also, I'll, I'll probably put it in the group. I am looking for anyone that you knew that taped Met games back in the day. I am on a mission to find more Kindness Corner. We currently have 50 episodes. I need to find more. Um, and I am also trying to locate Carl Earhart's son because I want to do an article on him, the, the sign man. I, you know, um, trying to find like some of the unique stuff that we grew up with and, and some of that stuff. So, you see uh, him want it, to tell the truth. Yeah, I, it's it's in our classic Mets videos in the in the video locker room. So, guys, again, thanks so much for making this show great and and making the group awesome. I appreciate you guys so oh, much. Wow. And uh, thank you. We'll see Good. you. Send see us you next all week. sweatshirts. I need I need the link again to order it. I, I can't find it. Uh, all right, I'll put it in the Facebook group. Now I gotta go, I gotta order one for Roger McDowell. <laughs> That'd be great. If I, I I'm o- I'm only gonna order it for Roger if he agrees to send me a picture of him wearing it. So that that's I'm gonna text him now. All right, guys. Good night right. and let's all go right. Mets, man. Let's go Mets. Good. Bye. Good night. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye.